Hello again. Hello once again. So I am back to continue the uh, discussion of forensic chemistry per chapter. So sit back and of course listen again to my discussion. And you have, if you have any clarifications, you can ask me through the comment section of the our YouTube channel, or you can privately message me on the messenger or any platforms that you can ask or clarify any things. And of course, for other criminology instructors or faculty that's, that is watching this video, you can openly criticize or you can give your own suggestions or you can give your own opinion with the discussion in order for us to have a healthy discussion or exchange of information with regards to topics. So if I have given uh, wrong information, you can correct me. And if you are uh, one or if you want to correct any information that has uh, discrepancy with your uh, resources or references, I am free to have a open communication or fruitful discussion with you. So for our next discussion, we are going to discuss hair and uh, textile fibers that is uh, in connection with forensic chemistry, of course. So going to the background of uh, forensic chemistry when it comes to the examination of hair, take note that it is the oldest form of uh, physical evidence and surprisingly, it is uh, much older than fingerprint. So take note of it. It is old in which it is very old than fingerprint. And of course, it is a valu valuable uh, physical evidence because we can now distinct human hair from uh, hair that is coming from animals or that uh, or fibers that have the same remnants or resemblance with hair or animal fibers or animal hairs. So when it comes to the history of hair examination, we trace it back in 1847 in which it is first utilized as a physical evidence in 1897 in which Rudolf Virchow become the first person to do an in-depth study of hair. In 1906, Hugo Max wrote a paper on the use of hair in forensic investigation to determine identity. And in 1931, Dr. Paul Kirk works on a new way to improve, improve the use of hair in forensic investigation. So that is uh, the historical background when it comes to the study of hair or when it comes to the hair alone. For the discussion of the collection, packing, and preservation of hair, uh, we are going to discuss first how to collect or when uh, the collection of the hair specimen. So first thing and foremost, you need to take note the proper equipments that uh, are going or that is going to utilize in order to collect a uh, hair specimen. So first thing, you need to use a vacuum and that is not the ordinary vacuum. So this vacuum has a filter on its mouth in order, in order to filter the hair specimen that you are now collecting in the crime scene, of course. And standard operating procedure, if you are collecting hair in the crime scene, it is a mass that you, uh, you need to separate the uh, hair that is collected in the crime scene from uh, different uh, containers or different papers, different darkest paper, in order to separate the places in, or in order to separate them from the places you have been collect or you, uh, yes, you have been collect or you have collected that uh, pieces of specimen. So if you have collected on the window part so you are going to separate it if you're collected on the floor you will be collecting the hair specimen from uh in which you have collected from the window from the floor from the uh from the bed from the any uh places in which you have collected the hair that is the standard operating procedure that you need to separate them uh, separate them from different packaging uh, next is, of course, if you are the investigator or if you are investigator, you need to immediately conduct the 
search or collection of uh, hair specimen in the crime scene because we all know that hair is a minute evidence that uh, if time passes, this uh, pieces of evidence may be tampered or may be gone in the crime scene because it can be immediately blown by the, by the air or it can be uh, swept away, it can be uh, Yes, swept away by a broom or it can be blown away by the air. That's why if you are the investigator, if you arrive at the crime scene, immediately you need to collect pieces of evidence, especially if there is a mass to collect a specimen in, uh, with regards to hair because it can be immediately tampered or it can be immediately gone from the crime scene because it is small and it is a minute evidence in which it cannot be seen by the naked eye. So in collection, uh, of course, it is again a mass that you need to use your hand if the pieces of evidence is very important, especially if you are now securing the credibility of the hair sample, especially if you want to uh, preserve the roots or what we call the follicular tug of the hair. Take note that the, the most important part of hair is the follicular tug. Why? Because the follicular tug contains DNA of the person who owns that hair. That's why if that is a very important hair specimen in which the follicular tag is still intact on that hair, you need or it is a must to collect it by hand in order to preserve the follicular tag. Next, you may also use lint rollers. So what are those lint rollers? So it is like a paintbrush that is rolling, but this lint rollers have a sticky part on it in which you are just roll it and the hair specimen will just stick in or will just stick on it. Next is a special filtered vacuum cleaner. So this is the thing that I am talking a while ago that if you are going to use vacuum, uh, there is a special vacuum that will now, uh, that is capable of mounting a filter in its mouth in order to, yeah, to screen the hair and other fibers if you are now going to vacuum this hair specimen. Next is there are two take notes in this uh, part or portion that if the evidence is stick on other object or it is stick on a specific object just like uh, scotch tape, comb or clothing, it is a standard operating procedure that you are now going to collect the whole pieces of evidence in which the hair specimen is attached. Follow, uh, next is if you use lint rollers, uh, it is again a standard operating procedure that uh, you need also to include the lint rollers in the packaging and take note that you need to use polyethylene uh, storage bag in order to avoid the contamination or the mixture of the components of the plastic bag and in the hair specimen. Polyethylene is the most safest bag in order for you to uh, store uh, the hair specimen. Next, uh, clothing that belongs to the victim uh, should be collected even though they are ran or they <coughs> they were they was delivered or they were delivered in the hospital or in the morgue that is a must that you need to collect them next is for the representative sample of hair uh, so what are we uh, talking about the representative sample of hair for example you need to collect a sample uh, hair specimen on the victim or on the perpetrator or on the suspect, uh, you need to collect them uh, per piece. And the uh, manual is requiring you or the police officer or the manual that is used by the police officer is requiring those person who are going to collect representative samples of hair that there should be a minimum of 50 hair head hairs to be collected and 24 pubic hairs that 
uh, that are going to be collected on the victim or on the perpetrator. And take note, it should be a full length hair or full grown hair in which in its um, uh, requirements that it should be, uh, that the roots should be intact or properly intact. Meaning you're going to pull the hair strand in which the root should be still there in order for it to be accepted by those persons who are going to examine this. And take note, 50 head hairs, is, it is very painful if you are going to pull this 50 hair strand. But of course, if you are going to uh, collect 50 hair strand in order to minimize the pain uh, that will be suffered by the uh, victim or the perpetrator, you need to pull it one by one in order to avoid, of course, the pain of pulling those hairs. And take note, make sure that the root should be intact in order for it to be accepted by the crime laboratory for the examination of this uh, hair specimen. Of course, if you have collected this uh, hair, that is a standard operating uh, procedure that you need to separate them from the areas that you have collected. If you have collected it on the head, you need to separate it from the collection of pubic, from the armpit, and so on and so forth. So, of course, the common area that you can collect uh, hair specimen is on clothing, combs, weapon, pocket fingerprints, hat, and etc. Uh, has come in, uh, in contact with the hair that has, uh, or of course, uh, body or areas in which hair is present. Next, um, for the victim and suspect, of course, it is discussed a while ago that you need to collect them. The question is, what if the victim is dead? Yes, there is again still a must for you to collect, even though the victim is dead. Uh, and in which it is required that you need to collect it from the uh, head and from the pubic area. And next, of course, the best way to collect uh, the pieces of evidence is by combing. So uh, it is not necessary that you will be pulling 50 hair strand. Uh, it is a practice in which if you, do, you are going to comb the hair, there, there is a possibility that the hair will be pulled. So it will now minimize the pain of the uh, collection of the hair strands. Next, when it comes to packing of a specimen, actually there are only two packaging or there are uh, two equipments that you are going to use in or, uh, if you are going to pack hair specimen. Number one is you need to place it in a druggist uh, powder paper that is a clean paper and it has uh, special foldings in order to properly secure the hair specimen. After that, you are going to place it on in the envelope and you are going to close the envelope with a scotch tape. But it is a standard operating procedure that uh, the scotch tape should not be in contact with the hair specimen because the scotch tape will immediately destroy the hair specimen in which it will now be useless in the court proceeding if the hair specimen will be in contact with the scotch tape. Next, it is not uh, appreciated or it will not be appreciated if the uh, pieces of evidence or the hair specimen that you have collected is fragmented or it is cut into pieces. Take note that the requirement it is, should be in a full blown or full grown hair in which the root is still attached. And of course, it is much more appreciated if the follicular tag is, is still intact with the specimen. Next. Uh, areas on object containing hair should be protected. Of course, that is uh, a must that the uh, specimen that you have collected, of course, it should be uh, placed into a cellophane or into a paper bag in order to secure the credibility and avoid the tampering and contamination of the pieces of evidence.
Next is the preservation of the evidence. Uh, it is discussed a while ago that, of course, you need to place it in a druggist powder paper and you are going to uh, place it in a, uh, uh, what we call it, you, we are going to place it on the envelope. Or others, they are uh, putting it onto a pill box or test tube. And of course, if you are going to uh, secure the pieces of evidence, there should be, of course, the label that is coming from the person who collected the pieces of evidence. Next, for the hair, for the definition of hair, it is a specialized epithelial outgrowth of the skin which occurs everywhere in the human body except on, except on the palm of the head and sole of the feet. It is an appendage of the skin. Hair is not completely round but may be oval or flattened. Its width is not always the same along its length. It starts out pointed and narrow and then stray or less the same. So take note of it that hair is uh, characterized or it is a specialized epithelial outgrowth of our skin in which if you are going to look the hair into the microscope, commonly our general notion is the hair is round. But if you are going to observe the hair, it is uh, oval in shape or it is flat and it is not necessary that this is a complete round. So that is the description of hair. Take note that there are, two, there are two types of hair. We have the real and we have the false hair. If you are talking about real hair, this uh, is the these are the long hair that we can be uh, located or that we can be seen on our body. So commonly, the long hair is located on our head. And if we are talking about the false hair, false hair are the short uh, hair on our body. So commonly, these this are the hair that is uh, growing on our body, on our hand, on our legs, on our pubic area. So we call them as false hair. No, uh, uh, Pubic, under the, in the pubic area, it is still categorized as real hair because it is long at the same time it is stiff. So, false hair commonly is located on the hand, on the body, and on the legs because they are short. At the same time, they are fine, curly, and woolly hairs. So, for parts of the hair, we have roots, we have shaft, and we have teeth. So, in order to avoid imagining where are those uh, portion can be located so commonly that is the representation of the parts so we have the roots we have the shaft we have the what is the other one the tip so you can immediately locate them on the uh, presentation that is uh, presented on the on this presentation so for your general um, Knowledge, take note that roots and follicular tag is not the same. So if you are talking about follicular tag, if you are going to pull your hair and there is a whitish color that is liquid on the bottom of the hair that you have pulled, that is what we call the follicular tag. If you are going to remove that follicular tag and you are going to see the end of the hair or the bottom of the hair, that is what we call the hair roots. So hair roots and follicular tag is not the same. Hair roots is the bottom end of the hair and follicular tag that is the whitish liquid that is oval in shape if you are going to pull hair. Next, for the parts of shaft, we have three. We have the cuticle, we have the cortex, and we have the medulla or the core. If you are talking about the cuticle, that is the outmost portion of the hair in which we can touch on it. That is the outmost. If you are uh, talking about the uh, layers of the earth, uh, cuticle can be represented as the crust. And if you are talking about the cortex, it is described as the mantle. And take note, cortex is the most thickest layer of our hair or of our of the shaft of hair or shaft 
alone because we can uh, hold our hair and as hair or this hair can be also called a shaft if it is in strand so if you are talking again in cuticle that is the outmost or the outside portion of the hair or the shaft and if you are talking about the cortex that is the inner portion of the shaft it which comprises the most thickest part of the shaft and medulla is the center canal of the hair so take note cuticle the outside cortex is uh, the inner thickest uh, part of the shaft and medulla is the center portion of the shaft uh, take note there are two classification of medulla in which the hair without medulla meaning there is no uh, center there is no canal there is no medulla that is uh, seen on the center of the hair and hair with medulla and of course medulla is classified into six classification it's either interrupted continuous fragmented solid and non-absent so this is the uh, parts of the shaft so commonly that is the cuticle or the hair cuticle uh, just like what i said that is the out side portion of the hair if they are talking about if we are talking about the cuticle that is the inside and the most thickest portion of the shaft and medulla is the center of the cuticle or of the shaft i should say next we talk about the uh, kinds of medulla so there are five we have the continuous so if you are going to the first image on the top if you're going to look to it so if you are talking about continuous if you have observed the medulla there is a complete dark on the center of the shaft so that is what we call the continuous medulla if you are talking about uh, interrupted that is uh, below the continuous we can uh, see that the center of the shaft there is a white area that there is a small white area on the medulla so that is what we call the interrupted medulla the middle portion that is the fragmented so if you are talking about fragmented the medulla is like a dot or dotted uh, da dotted black spot on the center of the shaft so that is characterized or that is a characteristics uh, that can be classified as fragmented medulla if we are talking about the solid uh, we cannot differentiate where is the medulla because the whole hair or yes the whole hair is very dark meaning you cannot differentiate where is the uh, medulla where is the cuticle and so in other parts of the hair because all of the hair is color black meaning that is characteristics uh, characterized as solid and of course the absence of medulla of course uh, looking into the center portion you cannot identify or there is no dark line on the center of the hair or shaft meaning there is now the absence or there is uh, no medulla on it next for the microscopic examination of hair what are the things that you need to uh, consider if you are going to examine hair so number one that is color so we have different colors of hair we have brown we have black we have white or yes we have white and so on and so forth we have blonde so that is the characteristics of color so uh, what is the uh, what we call that what is the pigment or what is the chemical that is now uh, what we call that chemical that is now responsible for the color of our hair so commonly the chemical that is responsible for the color of our hair that is our melanin 
So the absence of melanin on the body of a person, commonly, the hair will now turn to white because yeah, there is now the absence of melanin in our body. So commonly, old person experience the lack of melanin on their body. That's why their hair is now turning into white. Next, a uh, thing that you are going to take note or take into consideration if you are going to observe hair in a microscopic examination, if you are going to examine hair in using microscope, you are also considered the length uh, by actual measurement of the hair. The characteristics of hair, if it is stiff, uh, is weary or soft, the width breadth, so commonly, that is the width breadth, if we are talking about the width breadth, that is the whole composition of the shaft or the whole measurement of the shaft. And next, the characteristics of the hair tip if present. So commonly, uh, when we are going to examine the hair of a male uh, male subject, commonly there is no tip because commonly hair of males are uh, regularly cut. Unlike females, uh, they are only uh, cutting their hair or they are undergoing uh, trimming on their hair once every year or never that they are, did not undergo any trimming on their hair. That's why the, the tip of their hair is still present. So these are the different characteristics or these are the different description. If you are now going to, in the, uh, going to see the tip of uh, hair. So sometimes it is a characterized by healthy and split. Yeah. Uh, commonly, this is common to women because of course, uh, just like what I said a while ago, uh, women, uh, doesn't regularly cut their hair. That's why they're experiencing split ends. We have triple, triple split, we have feather, we have three, we have long, deep, baby, taper, white spot, offshoot, thickening, incomplete split, crinkle, right angle, and knot. So that is the different characteristics or that are the different characteristics of tip of hair of a human. Uh, we have the we are we can also or we are going also to take note or take into consideration if you are going to examine hair in a microscope we are also uh, taking down the manner by which the hair has been cut so scissor cut so commonly that is the appearance so it is very clean if it is abraded uh, commonly it is uh, it's like it is pulled or it's like a wire that is pulled. If it is razor cut, so we can uh, differentiate the scissor cut and razor cut. If it is a uh, scissor cut, it is a parallel. If we are talking about razor cut, it is slant. So round, if it, uh, it is still the tip is not cut, or yes, or if the hair is not cut for how many years, so it is round. If it is burned, that is the appearance, and it, if, if it is broken, that is the appearance. So there is no different shape if the hair is broken or abraded. So the condition of the roots based on bulb of the hair. So commonly there is the appearance, that is the appearance of the hair if it is pulled. That is the appearance of hair if it is uh, forcibly removed or number three, uh, that is the appearance of hair if it is shed. So, meaning the hair naturally falls on the uh, scalp of the person. Next, we are also going to uh, differentiate or characterize its cuticle. Next, the characteristics of the cortex, the presence uh, of dye in hair, determination whether it is naturally or artificially curled, so commonly, those uh, person that is under the negroid or yes, negroid ancestry, they are naturally curled individual or uh, our brothers that is under the Aita tribe or Aita minority, commonly their hair is naturally curled. We have characteristics of medulla. Next. So yes, we discussed this a while ago. Where can we locate the 
cortex, the medulla, the cuticle, and so on and so forth. Uh, we have the medullary index. So commonly, if you are going to examine the medulla of a person, we can immediately determine if it is coming, coming from a person or animal because uh, hair with narrow medulla belongs to human and certain monkey hair. So we, if we, we are going to examine medulla commonly, uh, zero, less than 0 0.5. But it doesn't mean if the medulla is less than 0 0.5, that is a human. Because if we are going also to examine the hair of monkeys, uh, their medulla is also 0 0.5, less than 0 0.5. Uh, hair with medulla approximately 0 0.5 belongs to hair of cow, horse, and others. And hair with thick medulla commonly they came from animals or other animals that is not classified as cow, horse, or others. So, yeah, if you are going to examine medulla, we can differentiate if it came from human or monkey. We can differentiate if it came from cow, from pigs, and so on and so forth, and other animals. And take, your, take note for the other aspects of hair examination. We can determine it by the uh, characteristics of hair. So, there are three races in this world. So we have the Negroid race hair, we have the Mongoloid uh, race hair, and we have the Caucasoid or the Caucasian race hair. So Negroids, so commonly this person are uh, located or they are living in the African region. So commonly uh, the characteristics or we can uh, describe their hair as contain heavy pigment distributed unevenly a thin cross section hair is usually kinky and mark variation in the diameter uh, along the shaft so uh, this um, uh, what we call that this description can be seen if we are now going to examine or we are going to observe the hair of a person who has a necroid ancestry in which we can uh, look it into microscope and we can describe them the same on the three descriptions that is present on this presentation. So commonly, that is the appearance of the hair of a person coming from a necroid ancestry. So. If there is a dead person, we can immediately the race of this person by merely examining its hair because uh, looking it into a microscope, immediately we can describe it and we can match it on the characteristics that Negroid, Mongoloid, and uh, Caucasian has. For Mongoloid race hair, so yes, it is very painful or it is very hard to accept that we Asians belong to this race in which in uh, Philippines, if you are talking about Mongoloid, it is just like an insult or it is just a bad word. But we need to accept that we Asian uh, belongs to this ancestry. Mongoloid race uh, hair is the name of our classification if we are now talking about the examination of our hair and we characterize our hair as a dense pigment distributed more evenly than necroid traces cross section of the hair will be rounded or oval hair is coarse is straight and little variation in diameter along the shaft and usually it is it contains heavy black medulla or core so that is the appearance of a uh, mongoloid race hair. For the last, that is the Caucasian race. So these are the person coming from Europe, from Africa, from New Zealand, from Australia. So the characteristics or the description of their hair, if you are going to examine it in the microscope, so commonly it contains very fine or coarse pigment and more evenly distributed than it is found in Negro or Mongolians. Cross section will be oval or round in shape, the same for, for, as uh, Mon Mongolians or Mongoloids, and usually straight or wavy and kinky. So that is the appearance of the hair of a uh, Caucasian or those person or yes, person that uh, is uh, affiliated with the Caucasian ancestry or Caucasian races. Next for the question, this is a question that is races during the discussion. Uh, the question is, 
can we determine the characteristics of a person by or characteristics or the sex of the person if we are going to examine the hair? So the answer is we cannot. But there is a general rule which says that male is generally uh, larger in diameter and shorter in length so because commonly uh, men is uh, of course uh, having a haircut regularly and uh, female is weary in texture or yes uh, they and uh, male have average approximately 1 to 350 of an inch in diameter while female average approximately 1 to 450 of an inch in diameter so we cannot uh, conclude that male is like that and female is like this because there is male having that kind of uh, uh, hair or diameter of hair and there is um, female that is having a diameter of hair that is the same to male so that is it is not conclusive that we can say that this hair is female because this is the diameter and this hair is uh, male because this is the diameter so it is not conclusive that's why we can not approximately determine if the hair is coming from male or female so we cannot uh, the second question is determination of the region from which the human has been uh, human hair has been removed. So uh, yes, uh, we can determine uh, the hair that is uh, removed by merely examining the hair. So commonly, if it came from scalp or within our head it is more mature than any kind of hair. So we can immediately classify it came from head or scalp because it is very mature in its characteristics. If it came from beard, so commonly its appearance in the microscope should be coarse, curved, very stiff, and often triangular in cross-section. If that is mustache, commonly triangular in shape and very stiff. If it is came from hair, from eyebrows, eyelid, nose, and ears, Commonly, its description is short, stubby, and have with medu wide medulla, I should say. Eyebrow and eyelashes are usually very short and has a sharp tip. For the trunk hair, it is a uh, vary in thickness along the shaft and uh, are immature but are somewhat similar to head hairs. They are fine, long tip ends. Next, for the limb hair, it uh, is described as uh it is similar to trunks hair but usually are not so long or so coarse and usually contains less pigments next auxiliary hairs fairly long and unevenly distributed pigments they vary considerably in diameter along the shaft and have frequently a bleached appearance it has a regular shape and structure looks like pubic hair but ends up ends are sharper and hair is not so curly. And next for the pubic hair, its uh, description is coarser and do not appear bleached. Wearier have more constriction and twist and usually have continuous broad medulla, have many broken and because of clotting rubs of against it. So we can immediately determine if you are very uh, oriented with the appearance, with the description, with the characteristics of hair coming from the different parts of our body so you can immediately uh, differentiate or you can dif uh, definitely identify if this hair coming from the different parts of our body in which it is characterized on different or there is no much there is no hair in our body that have different characteristics if you are going to collect it from the different parts of our body so still they have different characteristics from one another in which they can immediately differentiate from them for the determination of the appro approximate age of the individual so take note this is again a question can we determine the approximate age of an individual by merely examining the hair so the answer is no. we cannot determine the age of the person by merely examining the hair next for the hair microscopy or if you are going to or what are the different 
uh, tests or what are the different examination that we are going to undergo if we are going to yeah, test or examine hair. So number one, we have the light microscopy. So what is the purpose of light microscopy? There are two purposes. Number one is to identify the question hair and number two, that is to identify the question and the known hair that is collected in the crime scene and collected on the person or the perpetrator or the victim. Next, for the comparison microscope, the same for the light microscopy. It will now link the pieces of evidence that is collected at the crime scene to the perpetrator if they have the same composition, they have the same characteristics, and so on and so forth, that we are now going to match it if it is accurately came from the perpetrator or not. Next, for the same or the scanning electron microscope, there are two things that uh, is going to be determined if you are going the same. Number one, that is the DNA, and number two, that is the use of drugs. So commonly, uh, just like what I said a while ago, that the hair, uh, the part that has a trace of DNA on our hair is the follicular tag. The absence of the follicular tag, meaning there is no the absence of the DNA of the person. That's why it is very important for the investigator or for the person who are now going to collect the pieces of evidence to preserve the follicular tag of the hair. The absence of the follicular tag, meaning there is the absence of the DNA. So that is the importance of the follicular tag. Next, for the drug test, yes, we can still detect the presence of drugs even though the person used drugs for one, two, three, four, and how many months? We can determine still or we can detect still the presence of drugs on the body of this person. So commonly drug tests, if we are going to examine the hair, will, uh, the use will last for six months and others say it will last for two years. We can still determine the presence of drugs and the body. So one uh, advice or one expert says that if you want to, uh, the drugs uh, that you have taken sh should be, or it will now be, uh, be removed on your body or on your hair, there is a need for you to shave your hair in order to remove the presence of drug that you have used. So commonly, there are two tests that is utilized for the drug test. We have the RIA or the radio immunoassay and we have the ELISA. ELISA means the enzyme link uh, immunoabsorbent assay. So we are now moving from hair we are now shifting to textile fibers. So in general, the broad sense, the word textile derived from the Latin word textilis and the French textire, to weave or means to weave, and fiber means that can be converted into yarn. A yarn consists of fibers or filaments that have been twisted together. So that is just a, uh, discussing the entomology of the word textile. So there are two types of uh, fibers. So we have those uh, is uh, natural that is came from the nature and of course it is the man-made fiber. So it's up to you to examine it. So I will just uh, adjust the camera in order for you to see the whole uh, diagram that is presented that will now uh, differentiate those uh, fibers that is considered as natural and uh, considered as man-made fibers. So for the test for textile fibers, in order to determine its origin, commonly burning or ignition test. So what we are going to use with, or what are we going to do if we are going to use this ignition test? So procedure, a single fiber is applied with flame and one end and the following are noted. Manner of burning, how it is burned. Odor, well, what is the smell, appearance. So what is the appearance of the uh, fiber when it is uh, burned? So it is uh, observed in the microscope. Color of ash, it is also observed. Action of fumes or moist and red or blue litmus paper. Effect of litmus uh, or pieces of filter paper moistened with lead acetate commonly. Uh, 
uh, we are doing the burning test in order to test if the textile or the fiber is in us coming from na na nature, coming from animals, coming from vegetable, or uh, it is coming from the man-made fibers. So we have the Florence Florence test. So commonly we are uh, using it to determine the general group to which a fiber belongs. It is not reliable for positive identification of fibers. In general, the vegetable fibers exhibit a yellow fluorescence in ultraviolet light, whereas animal fibers should be bluish fluorescence. So the fluorescence of some common fiber is given in the following table as obtained by, yes, there is a table. So this is the table. So commonly, Florence test is uh, being used in order to identify if the um, fiber came from animal again and it, it came from vegetables. So these are the table that will now describe the result if we are now going the Florence test. So if it is a bleach, uh, bleach wool, it is bright light blue and light blue if that is daylight. So it is uh, there are two observations. Uh, that is the color if it is observed under the microscope and if it is observed in daylight color. So if it is unbleached wool, it is bright light blue and light yellow if that is a daylight color. If that is bleached wool, it is uh, characterized if it is observed in ultraviolet in ultraviolet, so bluish white to bluish yellow if it is in daylight why and so on and so forth it's up to you to uh, read or examine the table because it is just presented it's just for you to just review it next for the microscopic examination these are the descriptions if you are now going to examine it using a microscope a microscope so commonly if you are going to uh, look a cotton in a microscope, the description will be unicellular filament, flat, ribbon, like twisted, uh, spherically to the right or to the left. If we are talking about mercerized cotton, commonly they are straight, cylindrical, with uh, occasional twist, evenly lustrous, smooth, except for occasional transverse fold or wrinkles. If that is linen, commonly it is multicellular filaments, straight and cylindrical, not twisted or flattened, tapering to the sharp point. For the cultivated silk, there is a smooth, cylindrical, lustrous, thread, usually single but often double, the twin filaments held together, and so on and so forth. Next, we have wild silk, artificial silk, and wool. That is, again, the characteristics of the uh, different fibers if you are going to examine it in a microscope examination. So how important is fiber in forensic chemistry? Take note, it is, is still important as a trace evidence. Why? Because if the person perpetrated this uh, crime, and commonly, there is now a fiber that will now deposit on the victim. If it will be lifted on the victim and there is now a thorough investigation or examination with this uh, fiber and they find out that you are the perpetrator, they will now collect the uh, clothing that is uh, allegedly uh, uh, allegedly identified as the, as the clothes, clothes that you use during the crime and it will now cross match and if these fibers will have the, uh, the same composition their characteristics their description their appearance will be the same from uh, one another that is now corroborative evidence that you committed the crime because how come that the trace of your clothing, the fibers coming from your clothing is deposited on the victim or on the crime scene in which it is impossible that you didn't or uh, you, it is possible that you are around at the crime scene when the crime is perpetrated because there is now a trace of you, uh, specifically the fibers of your clothing that is present at the crime scene. That's why fiber, examination is very important as a corroborative evidence in different crimes that is perpetrated. Next, so commonly if we are uh, looking it into microscope, that is the uh, best or suitable representation of the things we have read a while ago that will now describe the description of the fibers when 
we are now utilizing microscope to observe them. For chemical analysis of fiber, so we have a staining test. So we will just add up chemicals and we will now look into the result if it uh, will be uh, positive into this color, meaning they are coming from animals or coming from vegetables. For the solution test, the say, uh, from the word itself, the solution test. So we will be adding up uh, a chemical and if it is dissolved or undissolved meaning it is positive to wool it is positive to silk and so on and so forth so description is if it is all positive it is wool if it is undissolved if you add this commonly those uh, fibers if you are going to add a certain chemical on it and if it will not dissolve commonly it is cotton linen wild silk and cellular silk so that ends our presentation or that ends my presentation so if you have a lot or a lot question or yes violent reaction or any additional on my presentation it, uh, i am willing to accept it by a message it's either on the comment box it's either private message on the facebook because i believe that uh, I cannot monopolize knowledge. We can monopolize or we can share knowledge, but I can't monopolize knowledge because still I am still learning and there are things that I need also to learn from the viewers or from other faculty. So once again, if you have questions, if you have clarification, if you have violent reaction, you can free to post it, you can free to PM or private message me, or you can text me or call me so uh happy uh sunday or yes happy day to each and everyone and i hope you are safe with this pandemic and the typhoon that is now uh that is now going into the philippines i hope you are safe and thank you